Hello, good morning. Uh, today's video is about the 19th century China and Japan. So this is what Japan looks like in the 1800s. Uh, I'm going to start with China. And by 1800, China it really looks like a strong civilization on the outside, but on the inside, it's starting to fall apart. Um, we have huge increase in population uh, from 180 million to 430 million in just a hundred year time. That means that we're having trouble with food, Peasants are moving around hoping to find food and find land to live on. Uh, land is being sold because owners are forced to sell the land. And the Chinese peasants, they're just deep in poverty by this point. The only people really who are making money are the landowners and public officials by that point. Uh, we also have to look at Britain. Britain was in the process of building a global empire and China is really on its radar. Um, what would happen is the British merchants would import a lot of tea and porcelain and silk from China and then they would try to sell stuff back but the Chinese didn't want to buy any of it. That means that the British they're forced to pay the Chinese for the goods in silver. Now to balance the cost of imports Britain is going to start selling the drug opium to the Chinese and get them hooked on drugs. By 1830, uh, eight out of every 10 people that live in the city of Canton were addicted to British opium. Now, a lot of people make huge profits off of this. Um, the Chinese government's going to become really, really um, horrified over the number of profits being made by the British. And also the addiction issue gets really, really bad. Uh, so the silver that Britain had used to pay China now turn to China paying silver for British drugs and the script is really flipped around. So the Chinese government is going to declare opium illegal and this leads to something known as the Opium War in China. <clears throat> uh, there's a Chinese government official named Lin Seihu who was sent to Canton and ordered the Chinese and foreign merchants to surrender all the opium the British agree, but instead of giving it to this Chinese official, they're going to put it onto naval ships that belong to the British Navy. And that makes the opium property of the British government. Now the Chinese officials are going to choose to board the British naval ships. They seize the drugs, and the British government is going to claim that was an act of war. And then war is declared by Britain on China, September 4th, 1839. Um, it's very simplistic to say the war doesn't go well for China, but the war goes really, really badly for them. By the end of summer 1842, the British forced the Chinese to sign a treaty, and this treaty is known as the Treaty of Nanking. It's a very one-sided treaty. One of the things that happens is... China's opened up. Originally where China only allowed the British to do trading in one, one port, the city of Canton, now there are going to be five ports open. Uh, the city of Canton, Amoy, Fuchao, Ningpo, and Shanghai are all going to be opened to the British. That means British merchants, British government officials, British families can all move to those five cities. Not only that, but the British force the Chinese government to pay for all the destroyed opium. And so Britain gets $21 million from this. Hong Kong is given to Great Britain. And Hong Kong it will stay British until 1997. And then anything that Great Britain wants to get from China, basically China has to give them. If another country is given something, then China has to give Great Britain that exact same thing. And then finally, uh, the Treaty of Nanking allowed British subjects to be tried and arrested according to British law. So Chinese law did not apply to British citizens anymore. Now after the British beat the Chinese, the French are going to get involved in it too. And France has their own little opium war that goes from 1856 to 1860. And it's pretty, this, the reasons for it are pretty sketchy. 
supposedly there's a French religious figure, a French missionary, who is supposedly arrested and tortured and executed by the Chinese, and the French are going to use that as an excuse to declare war. Just like against Britain, the French beat China, and the Chinese government is allowed to, or forced to allow Christianity in. The Chinese have to pay the French for the cost of the war, and the, the dynasty of China is forever weakened. It never regains its strength after these two wars. After China loses a war to both France and Great Britain, there's this there's a creation of these spheres of influence. Basically, each part of China is going to be controlled by a different country instead of by the Chinese government. So, for example, Russia gets Manchuria, Britain gets the Yangtze River and Shanghai, France is going to get control of China at the southern part near Vietnam, uh, even Japan and Germany are going to get involved in this too. So China, even though it's never truly um, it's never really colonized, it loses control of parts of its own country. Eventually, there's going to be a rebellion that's going to really kind of throw out the foreign, or it's an attempt to throw out the foreign powers, but it doesn't work. And this is known as the Taiping Rebellion. Uh, the Taiping Tianquo, or the Kingdom of Heavenly Peace, is known. It's founded in 1850 by this guy named Hong Sui Xuan. And Hong Sui Xuan, he studied for the civil service ex exam, but I don't think he passed it. Uh, he was very heavily Christian, and eventually he has visions that he is the brother of Jesus. And he's been called upon to destroy the dynasty and turn the country over to the people. He gains a following, and if you followed the ideas of Hong Sui Shu or Xuan, and if you become a member of this kingdom of heavenly peace, you cut off your pigtails, and then um, you would demand an end to private ownership, equal rights for women, an end to foot binding. You want to allow women to work in the government and serve in the army, and then liquor, opium, and tobacco. Are, so they want them to be outlawed, and then if you're caught using them, then it's a death penalty. <clears throat> Ultimately, the, the Taiping Rebellion, it's not liked by anybody. Merchants, they're afraid that they're going to lose everything because of the end of private ownership. The wealthy, they're afraid that they're going to lose all their land and their fortune. The peasants are afraid of change. Another part of this rebellion was the idea of abandoning and making the idea of ancestor worship illegal and that was a big deal for peasants they didn't want that much of a change in their life and then last but not least no foreign government is going to support this rebellion because the the chinese emperors the the manchu dynasty give foreign countries everything they want so why would they want to get rid of them in the end this rebellion lasts over a decade, and more than 20 million Chinese are killed. The government is going to say, you know what, maybe we need to do something about this. <laughs> and there is an attempt to modernize and reform. Uh, the Emperor Huang Su is going to go along with the idea of reform. There's this idea of creating a parliament separating powers, creating a constitution, publishing the budget, creating schools. And in 1898, this all goes into effect for 100 days. Between June 11th and September 21st, these reforms are in action, but the aunt of the emperor overthrows them and undoes all of the reforms, all of the changes. Eventually, we have something known as the Boxer Rebellion. <clears throat> the Boxers are better known as the Righteous and Harmonious Fists. And they're anti-Western, they're anti-Christian, they're anti-violent. And in 1900, they're going to rise up. They're going to kill foreign officials. They're going to kill thousands of Chinese Christians. They burn down 
hundreds of buildings. They take over the capital city. And there's a multinational army of British, French, Russian, Japanese, American, and even German soldiers that are going to come and save the government of Japan, or the government of China, I mean, from being destroyed. Now, once that's all done, there's this man named Sun Yat-sen who kind of rises up after the Boxer Rebellion, and he starts another group of revolutionaries. But this one's a little different. He actually gains outside support. He gains support from the Japanese government who's willing to support him. He gets money and support from Chinese citizens living in Hawaii and the United States. And he creates what's known as the three principles of the people. He wants a China that is based on nationalism. So no more dynasties, and they're going to try to create a republic. And then a China that's based on democracy. Now, I'm not talking about like the government democracy. I really mean more like individual freedoms that they didn't have under the the rule of the emperor. And then last but not least, there's this idea called agrarianism, where Sun Yat-sen wanted to distribute land to peasants, but not until it's actually bought and paid for, and the landlords get something out of it too. Now the ideas of Sun Yat-sen come to fruition. On October 10th, 1911, there is a rebellion, and there is a revolution. And the overthrow of the Manchu dynasty happens, and over 4,000 years of dynastic rule come to an end. Now, the other half of this lecture is about Japan. And last time we talked about Japan, um, the Tokugawa shogunate had taken over, and they closed Japan. And the Tokugawa closure lasted from 1635 all the way to 1853. In 1853, the U.S. president, Millard Fillmore, don't worry if you haven't heard of him, most people haven't, is going to order the U.S. Navy to sail to Japan, and in charge of this Navy fleet is Commodore Matthew Perry. Uh, he's going to sail in Tokyo Bay on July 8, 1853, where he gives the shogun a letter, and his letter asks for free, free access, fair treatment of sailors, and the establishment of a refueling station. Commodore Matthew Perry said, I'll be back in one year for your answer. And in 1854, Perry returns. And when he returns, the U.S. and Japan will sign a treaty known as the Treaty of Kanagawa. Under the Treaty of Kanagawa, it's completely unfair to the, China, the Japanese. Um, U.S. citizens are protected by the U.S. Army. U.S. citizens are only subject to U.S. law. Tariffs are set so that Japan cannot sell anything to China. To, uh, Japan can't sell anything to the United States, but the United States can sell anything it wants to to Japan. And within two years of that treaty being signed, there are 15 other countries with a very similar treaty. And Japan is open and can't go back. Now, the arrival of the United States into Japan is really going to cause a lot of debate within Japan. And there's this question over whether they'll adapt or whether they'll try to stay the same. And in 1866, the Chozu and Satsuma clans are going to agree with each other that the emperor should be restored, the shogunate should, should fall apart, and they're going to take control of the court, overthrow the shogun, and appoint the emperor into political power. Now, the emperor was only 15 years old. His name at the time was Mutsuhito, but we know him better today as Meiji. And he's going to rule all the way from 1868 to 1912. This becomes known as the Meiji Restoration. Now, the Chozu and Satsuma clans are really going to run the government, but Meiji is the, the figurehead. And they're going to try to westernize. Um, April 1868, they get rid of classes. They are going to call for a public, like a public assembly, a government assembly becomes known as the Diet. Feudalism is, is ended. Samurais have to turn in their swords. 
and a Western style military is going to be created. Japan is going to ask Western advisors to come in and help them modernize. And then Japan also sends students and advisors to other countries to learn what they can from Germany and Great Britain and the United States and France and all those European countries. Eventually this will come to a constitution. And the constitution of 1889, it's going to settle on a constitutional monarchy very similar to what the Germans had. Uh, there's an emperor and his advisors. And then there's going to be basically a military advisor who can do whatever he wants. The parliament or the diet is created that can make laws and advise the emperor. It's got two houses, an upper house and a lower house. Voting rights are given to anybody over 25 years of age who pay taxes. And then they're going to be given freedom of speech, religion, press, the freedom from search and seizure, except in cases provided in law, meaning the emperor could stop freedom of the press or freedom of religion in certain cases. By the year 1890, the J Japanese population is over 50 million people. It's out of food, it's out of resources, and the Japanese government is going to organize this colonization project. Eventually, Japan just decides it wants to take territory and starts to take land near it. Uh, most famously, it takes over Korea and makes Korea a, a colony, but it's also going to go to war against Russia and take over parts of Manchuria. Now, Manchuria, never mind the fact it was actually part of China, uh, it didn't control it. Uh, it was controlled by Russia because of spheres of influence. <clears throat> after beating China in war and after beating Russia in war, Japan is going to be seen as a fully westernized country and it is a fully westernization, a full industrialization in less than 60 years. And by 1910, Japan is seen as an equal power and it is treated as an equal to any European country. All right, nice and short. We're just a little over 15 minutes. I appreciate you watching. Thank you.